All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, boy, I was in suspense that whole time. Like, am I next? Am I next? I don't know. All right, here we are after riding a wave of adrenaline. Um, okay, uh, name's Jeff Terrell. I am an, a software craftsman at Role Model Software in Holly Springs, North Carolina, very near Cognitech headquarters. And I'm going to be talking about writing macros and how to do that safely. Ma macros are powerful tools, but uh, you can kind of hurt yourself if you're not careful. So here are a few tips for how to do them safely. Uh, you do have to know what a macro is before you'll get anything out of this talk. Sorry. All right, tip number one, don't use a macro unless you have to. Functions are much simpler. If you can use a function, use a function. Don't try to use something fancy. Just st stick with what's, what works and what's simple. Uh, note that functions are values, macros are not. So for example, you cannot return a macro from a function. You cannot pass a macro to a function. Uh, but there are some legitimate use cases for macros, and they involve um, manipulating the evaluation to some extent. So here are some, some common use cases for macros. Conditional evaluation, such as what when or if does. Multiple evaluation, such as what for does. Binding, like let. Notice that the names in the binding statements are not evaluated normally. Um, accessing parameter expressions before they are evaluated, such as what the threading macro does. And DSLs, since you control evaluation. Um, you can also access the caller's context, but don't do that. Uh, maybe in some cases, but, but don't do that. All right, tip two. Include an example expansion after the macro, because they're often easier to read than the code themselves, the code itself. Uh, users of your macro will thank you later. That includes yourself. You'll be glad you did. So for example, if you have a numeric if macro, not caring so much about what the body of that macro is right now, just have a comment afterwards that says, this call expands to this code. It makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on. As a bonus tip, um, writing the expansion like this in a comment first before you write your macro makes it a lot easier to write your macro. Tip three, append expression to each parameter of a macro. The real key distinction to keep in mind about macros as opposed to functions is that functions get parameter values after they've been evaluated, but macros get them before evaluation. In other words, macros get the expressions. So having that visible in the name of the parameters of your macro really aids clarity as you're writing the macro. Tip four, capture your assumptions. This really helps callers, if they violate an assumption, to get a clear error message. Note that you can assert about the input expressions, which means you'd have your assert outside of the returned expansion, or you can assert about the values after they've been evaluated, in which case the assert statement would be inside the expansion. And also, tool spec is great for this, so good tool. Tip five, use the backtick operator. This is called the syntax quote operator, and it's like quote, except that you can unquote inside of it. So it's really tailor-made for uh, this, this kind of a use case where you're generating some expression that depends on some input value. It's a really convenient way to build an expression. Tip six, I, I mentioned earlier that you can uh, know your caller's context uh, inside of a macro because your macro is actually expanding into code in that calling context. Um, and so it's important, because you're in that context, that you don't conflict with anything that the caller is doing. And of course, anything that the caller is doing is completely outside of your control uh, when you're inside the macro. So uh, don't use a name willy-nilly. Use a ginsimmed name, which is very unlikely to conflict with anything that the, um, that the caller is using. And note that if you're inside a syntax quote context, it's very convenient to use the auto ginsim suffix, which is just a hash mark. Um, so that's a good, good way to do that. Tip seven, avoid evaluating an argument multiple times. This is usually a source of surprise to the caller. Uh, now, if you're intentionally doing that, and that's the intended use case of your macro, obviously that would uh, be an exception. But um, it's especially surprising if the ex one of the input expressions contains a side effect, and that side effect happens multiple times, that might be a, a source of great surprise to the caller. So a good rule of thumb, uh, is that each parameter expression should appear in the expansion exactly one time. Obviously, that can be violated, but um, you know what you're doing. Tip eight, macro expand one is a great way to debug a macro because it returns the expansion that you get back. 
Uh, I like to pass that to pprint to see what it's printing. And lastly, tip nine, build the expansion with helper functions. Now, if it's a really simple macro, you don't need to do this, but if your macro is doing any sophisticated transformation of the input expressions, remember that those expressions are just closure data structures. It's just a list, usually, with some embedded other data structures in it, perhaps. So how do we deal with data enclosure? We use functions, right? Um, so you can totally do that. You can have separate, you can have multiple helper functions that you're calling to build up your expression, maybe make multiple passes on the input expressions. Um, it's really a lot easier to decompose the, the work that way. Note that functions too can use the syntax quote operator. It's not restricted to being inside of a macro context. Uh, so uh, that's all I got. Uh, in conclusion, macros are great tools, but don't cut yourself. Um, check out my employer. We do custom software for forward-thinking companies or find me on Twitter. And thank you for your six minutes.